Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, work we've been doing with sequencing. And before we start, uh, just uh, put it a little bit in context. And so what's been happening in human genetics overall. And so if you look at human genetics this century, uh, what you'll see is that pretty much every year, we've had about four times more data than the year before. Uh, and that has uh, big implications. Some of the things that were hard uh, 15 years ago at the beginning of the century uh, are now straightforward. So we now have uh, many genetic variants associated with many different traits. Uh, but some parts of the process are still very hard. And as you heard from Kristen, one of the challenges is figuring out uh, the mechanism, how we go from the genetic signal to something confident that we can use to develop better treatments. Uh, I think th the other thing that I wanted to give you a flavor of, uh, of the challenges as data uh, gets bigger is that the, the way you deal with it and the, and the optimal strategies for sharing it also change. And so here's a, a slide that tries to give a little bit of context. These are some studies I've been involved in starting uh, back in 2000 and going up to now. And you can see that the level of detail, this is parallel to what uh, Kristen was showing in one of her slides about how many genotypes are available. Level of detail with which we measure each sample has been increasing. So early on, you could only measure handfuls of genetic variants and you'd have very specific hypotheses. Maybe you'd be studying uh, uh, obesity and you'd say, oh, I think it's something to do with how you process sugar. And so you'd m measure a specific gene that's involved in sugar processing and a specific set of variants in there. And after you analyze it, and whether you publish it or not, that data is probably not so interesting to most other people, because everyone else will have their own idea about what genes and variants are important. Uh, about uh, you know, now almost 10 years ago, it started to become possible to measure variants in every gene in the genome in one go. And the data becomes much more useful to others because I might decide to focus on a particular gene involved in sugar metabolism. You could look at the same data and look at other completely different genes. Uh, and now, as the detail keeps increasing, uh, one big challenge is that uh, a few years ago, the standard was if you generate one of these big data sets, you make it available to others. You say, if you'd like to have a copy, I can give you a copy. Uh, in, in these most recent ones, uh, this, this uh, top med uh, study that uh, Christian alluded to, uh, this data ends up being something, at the moment, something like four or five petabytes on disk. And so if you said, you know, I, I'd like to get a copy, we could say, sure. Uh, but then you'd have to say, well, now you need to pay Google a million dollars or buy several thousand hard drives so you can keep your own copy. And so it's not practical to do that, even if it's, you know, in, in theory, possible. Um, also, for context, this is a, a status of the field as of uh, 2002. Joel Hirshhorn uh, uh, and colleagues looked at 166 associations that had been studied three or more times. So they said, you know, this pair of a trait and the, and the disease has been studied at least three times. And they said, how often are the results consistent? What they found is only six of those were consistently replicated. So this is actually a pretty dire uh, state, but now it, things look rather different. And so uh, you can pick almost any trait you like. I picked uh, macular degeneration because this is an analysis that was done uh, by Lars, uh, who used to work with me and is now here in the Jepson Center. Uh, but uh, here, uh, you know, you see genome-wide, all, all the chromosomes, many, many variants, and you see many regions of very strong association. And we like to, to claim that, you know, even with knowing very little biology, you could look at these and say, look, there's the complement factor H gene, complement factor I, complement 9, uh, complement 2, and complement factor B, complement 3. And you say, wow, even if I know nothing about biology, it sounds like the complement pathway is important for macular degeneration. Uh, but this is a, a great simplification of what's going on. Because if you zoom into any of these regions in the genome, you'll see that there's this set of variants that are associated, and there's many genes nearby. Sometimes, for example, if we find that many of these clusters of associated variants fall near the complement pathway genes, we try and use that to make a story. Sometimes, for example, in this case, there's a gene here called VEGF. We know that for macular degeneration, there's uh, one class of very effective drugs, and they all act by blocking VEGF. And so this fits very well, and we say, ah, that's probably what's going on. 
But when you find something really new, uh, you know, here's a region where there's no complement gene and none of these genes has a natural story about how it's involved, it gets to be rather hard. It gets to be rather hard to decide if it's uh, SYN3 or TIMP3 or one of these several other genes on the side. In this case, uh, Lars made an observation that there's a rare Mendelian disorder called Sorbis uh, characterized by mutations in the end of TIMP3 and uh, out of the 10 known variants when we started, 8 resulted in the addition of a cysteine probably making it hard for the protein to fold. And so he designed an experiment where we looked for all the possible cysteines you could imagine, all the possible ways you could add a cysteine to this gene. We ended up looking in uh, 16,000 cases of AMD and 17,000 controls collected from 20 different sites around the world, so about 35,000 individuals in total. And what you see is that these extra uh, cysteine variants or one of the variants that previously had been shown to uh, affect folding uh, because they caused Sarbis, they show up 28 times in the 16,000 cases but only once in the 17,000 controls. These are all extremely rare events but they suggest that uh, you know TIMP3 disrupting it uh, severely increases your risk of disease by quite a lot by a factor of about 30. And the other thing that's interesting is that these are all super, super rare events. These are things that you wouldn't see in a genotyping array. We're talking mostly 1, 2, 5, 4, 14 people out of 16,000, right? So uh, you need to look at very large numbers and you need to have the complete sequence. But what we would love to do is not to do this one gene at a time, but to be able to do this for any of these hundreds of regions that are now associated with macular degeneration or any other trait and look at each of the genes there, see what happens in terms of rare variants. Uh, and so this is just the summary and interpretation. So a few years ago, uh, we started this Thousand Genomes project, which set out to figure out how we could scale up sequencing strategies, how we could apply them to discover variation in many different settings. When the project started in 2008, we estimated that sequencing these 1,000 individuals would require about 80% uh, of the sequencing capacity in the world for two years. You know, now, you know, many large labs could do this in a few weeks. You know, so th this is just how things have evolved in that period. Uh, sort of things that you learn are how much variation is in each human genome. And so this shows, for example, that an average genome, uh, and these are summaries from different parts of the world. Here are genomes from Africa, from uh, American populations, uh, South Asia, sorry, East Asia, South Asia, and Europe, you know, a typical genome might have about 4 million variants. If they're from Africa, maybe about 5 million. These American populations usually are a mix of African, uh, Native American, and European, and so depending on the exact mixing for each individual, they have between 4 and 5 million variants. And you can see the different kinds of variation you have. Uh, but you can actually go into this data much more deeply. They can, for example, tell you about the history of each population. Here, each curve result represents one of the populations we sampled. We're looking at thousands of years from the present. And you see that, for example, wherever you sample people in the world, if you go back one or 200,000 years ago, they have the exact same history, the exact same pattern of ancestral population size. Uh, but then as you move closer to the present, you see two separate histories. Here in yellow are all the African populations. They, they have only a smaller decrease in size about 20 to 50,000 years ago. And all the other populations in the world, a much larger decrease in size. And this is when a small number of individuals moved out of Africa to colonize the rest of the world. So this is the out of Africa bottleneck. And then you see the expansions eventually to modern sites. Uh, Part of the, the challenge in the project was trying to figure out how to analyze this data. In the initial stage, we had three main analysis groups, one at the Broads, one in Michigan, uh, one at the Sanger Center in Cambridge. And we all said, hey, we'll take all the data we're generating, do our best to analyze it, uh, and then decide which analysis was best. So we designed a series of experiments to validate the, the results. And so we, you see here that, for example, for According to this metric of error, how many errors we made at homozygous sites, the Broad did the best. They had the, the lowest error in this set of validation experiments. 
we were the best for heterozygotes, and the Sanger was the best for homozygous non-reference errors. And these are only three metrics of error. We had many more. And so we had all these dispassionate arguments where we'd say, you know, obviously the right metric of error is heterozygote error because most interesting variants are in heterozygotes. And the Sanger would say, no, 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 no. The most interesting thing is to look at homozygous sites. And we do the best there. And the Broad would say, most things are homozygous for the reference. That's what we care the most about. And uh, we were kind of deadlocked for a long time. Uh, and uh, in one of our meetings, uh, one of our funders was there listening in, and they were very frustrated by all this. And they said, you know, you have these three solutions. Uh, why don't you combine them? Why don't you let them vote at each position and decide which is the right answer if two of them agree? And I remember thinking, what a terrible idea. You know, how could you let two wrong solutions outvote the correct one? <laughs> but since they were our major funder, I said, you know, what an interesting idea. We will try it and we'll report back. And so we tried it and it turns out that uh, it was better uh, in every metric than any single solution. So, so in this case, the non-scientist was correct. Uh, and uh, it turns out uh, in these very complicated problems, you do need to bring in uh, different perspectives, not just in the analysis, but in all steps. And that turns out to make a, a big difference. So moving uh, to the present, you know, as we think about applying sequencing at scale, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project uh, called TopMed by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the US. The idea is to add uh, whole genome sequencing data to many of the ongoing uh, large uh, cohort studies there. Uh, it's a uh, collaboration between several large sequencing centers. They get all the data. It comes to Michigan where we combine all the sequence data together. Eventually it goes to NCBI, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, where anybody can get access to it and use it for many different purposes. There's a parallel process in Seattle where the phenotypes are being harmonized. Uh, at the moment, as of uh, a few days ago, we had sequenced uh, 30,000 uh, deep human genomes, uh, the vast majority of them uh, passing quality checks. Uh, this is the average depth for each genome, about 38x. And uh, in terms of uh, amount of data generated, uh, 3.9 times 10 to the 15. Mm -hmm. Now, most of you might not have a, a great idea what 3.9 times 10 to the 15 looks like. And so since it's summer, I try to put it in context. It's about the number of grains of sand in a small beach. Uh, and it turns out that there's a, a bit of uh, controversy about how big a grain of sand is and how much sand is in a beach. So you could, you could go from this to maybe the coastline of, uh, uh, you know, North Trondelag or something like that. Although there's not so much sand here. So, uh, uh, but uh, a number that's more stable is how you convert corn production to kernels of corn. And so it turns out in the U.S. Uh, there's uh, about 1.3 times 10 to the 15 kernels of corn produced every year. And our sequence data at the moment is 3.9 times 10 to the 15. So imagine looking at each of these kernels of corn and scoring what do they look like and how confident you are of each call. And that's what we've done for you know, the equivalent of three years of corn production. Of course, we are uh, more ambitious than just uh, measuring them. And so you'd like to say we can assign each of these kernels to an individual and if one of these individuals as heart disease, we'd like to know which kernel went wrong and why they got sick. Uh, or if you believe that, you know, the genetic code is the basis of life, you might want to say, hey, I can take the sequence and reconstruct the person. And then you start to run into problems because you can take the exact same sequence, the exact same recipe about how you interpret it and get different results. Because, you know, just as when you're cooking, everyone changes the recipe a little bit. When you take the sequence data and you try to interpret it, everybody interprets it a little bit different. And in the context of this uh, project, when we sequenced the same sample in different places, we saw that everybody came up with somewhat different answers. And also that uh, you know, even after we try and harmonize the data from scratch, even though we can remove most of the differences, there are still quite a few. Uh, now, glossing over that I wanted to show. Okay, so this is 29,000 genomes. Uh, the, the most recent analysis includes about uh, almost 19,000 that have been sequenced by early May. We think by the end of the year we'll have 
between 60 and 70,000, uh, and uh, 184 million variants, so, uh, and uh, uh, SNPs, and about 10 million indels. Uh, there's different ways to, to try and summarize this. Uh, this is just showing that the number of variants, SNPs, and indels in any individual is very strongly correlated, as you'd expect. Uh, and this is, for example, taking all the variants and saying you have 184 million variants. It turns out about 40% are seen in a single individual. So most of uh, variants are seen in very few people. And this is even more true when you look at the most interesting ones, things that change a protein. About 50% are seen in an individual. Those that loss of function, that truncate a protein, an early stop, a larger fraction in a single person. And the same for, for indels. Overall, about 40% in one individual. When we look at things that change proteins, that's closer to 50, or that put an early stop or a frame shift in the protein, closer to 60. Uh, at the moment, you, you know, one way to think about this, 37,000 loss of function SNPs, 30,000 frame shifts, that's about 67,000 variants. So every gene in the genome has an average of three or four individuals where it's knocked out, where there's a, a stop uh, in the gene somewhere. And, okay, and so in, in trying to make the data available to our collaborators, we've done a couple of things. We've set up a, a, a server where, uh, you know, everybody in the project can go and see what's the current status for any gene, how it's been covered, and then see a list of variants. Here, here's CFH, one of the AMD genes. But we've also been thinking about how to make analysis convenient. And so one challenge is we're generating these very large data sets. Uh, these analyses, if you did them in a simple way, would probably take many months or years. And we have lots of different analysts from all these different studies who have their own questions that they'd like to answer about the data. And uh, a big challenge is that most of them don't have the computational expertise on how to, to do this. And so we've set up uh, this NCORE analysis server where any analysts in the project can come, upload a set of phenotypes, uh, say something about the model they'd like to do, something looking at each SNP, controlling for age and sex, maybe looking at case status. And then the server combines that with the genotype data, uh, runs the analysis uh, on the cloud, and eventually uh, returns results. And this all happens in a browser so that, uh, you know, almost, uh, or that many different people working in each of the individual studies can run analysis at scale without having to get a copy of the data, and without having to become experts on running the analysis on a compute cluster. And you know, we've tried to make the results interactive, so you know, people can generate these Manhattan plots, they can look around, uh, they can see QQ plots like Kristen showed you before that basically see are things working properly. And they can actually move the mouse over any of the SNPs, get details, and they can, for example, uh, click on any of these to see uh, a detailed view of that region with all the genetic variants uh, and then uh, in context of the genes. And so this all happens in a browser uh, it, without people having to get a copy of the data, having to become experts on how to run it. And this turns out to be a powerful idea uh, and one that we've been applying in different contexts. Uh, you know, a, a different uh, similar study is what we're doing in Michigan, uh, collecting samples from our hospital. Uh, now patients who come in for surgery get invited to participate. Uh, we've tried to make the consent very short, so it's about one page, and also very clear because we had this problem that people sign up all this paperwork when they go for surgery in the US, and if you don't make it short and clear, they might not even realize that they've joined the study, which is a very bad thing. You know, so if you follow up a few weeks later and you say, did you know you joined the study? What are you talking about? That's not really what you want. Um, but so we've set this up where you can, for example, then say, hey, what's the current status of discovery for type 2 diabetes? You see the genome-wide plot. You can go to any variant, see the result of that variant against all the different traits. See, oh, look, there's another interesting signal see the genome-wide plot for that, and then hover around. And this uh, is interesting for, for many reasons, both in terms of making the data accessible, but it, and also in terms of when you have rich genetic data and rich health data, you can answer questions about many different traits. You know, so if I, I read a paper 
a few days ago that talked about this variant in liver disease, I can say, hey, what does our data say about that? Uh, and you can see, oh, it shows that patients who have this variant often have uh, different types of chronic liver disease. But I could do this for one of the variants in the macular degeneration study. You know, and here macular degeneration is what shows up for that set of those sets of patients. Or I can also look at completely different variants. You know, here's one that's been associated with freckling and skin color, and I would find out that in this set of individuals, that's actually associated with skin cancer uh, and uh, some other precancerous uh, skin lesions. Uh, so. The, the secret of getting all these things done is having lots of smart people around. These things take uh, lots of uh, creativity and time to do. And uh, if you have one minute, I also like to make the point that, you know, I, early on when we said, let's study this gene and this outcome, let's study the sugar gene and the obesity, that data is only interesting to you. You measure the whole genome, well, then you can ask about any gene and you can ask about many different traits. And so it can, you expand the range of things you can do. You know, and now, you know, when you have whole genome sequencing and often cohorts with very rich data, the set of things you can do is beyond what any one group or team of investigators might do. And the sort of surprises that you find in the data uh, can be very unexpected. And so one interesting surprise in the macular degeneration data, which I, I love to, to show, was this observation that when we started, uh, we, we noticed this uh, weird pattern that many of the individuals that we thought were males did not have a Y chromosome. And so, you know, so you, that's one of the basic checks you do on the data when you start. And we thought, you know, something went really wrong. Someone mixed up all the samples and it's going to be a disaster. But after uh, some investigation, it turned out that uh, once you were older, many males were missing their Y chromosome. And this had been shown already uh, back in 95 that, you know, blood cells start losing their Y chromosome as you age. Uh, and so I think the, the bottom line is that this is completely different than what we started on, studying macular degeneration. And also, if you're one of the males in the audience and you're getting older, you know, you're not as much of a man as you used to be. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.